Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's time for Catalog and Cocktails presented by Data.World, the data catalog for leveraging agile data governance to give power to people and data. We're coming to you live from Austin, Texas. It's an honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverage in hand. Hi, Data.World, the data I'm Jim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, and this is Juan. Hey, Tim, I'm Juan Cicado, principal scientist at Data.World, and as always, it's Wednesday, middle of the week, towards uh, the end of the day, and it's our time to take a break to go chat about data, have some cocktails, and have a lot of fun. And today, our very special guest is a friend of mine who uh, we go back from the semantic web community. This is Dan Bennett. He's the chief data officer at S&P Global Commodity Insights. Uh, previously, Dan would go back, I remember you were at Thomson Reuters and then at Refinity where you're doing all the PermID, the, the PermID linked data graph. Go to permid.org. You can check all the stuff that Dan was working on a long time ago. It's been the foundations. Dan is a guy who's gotten the whole semantics and knowledge and linked data and all that stuff from the beginning. And it's awesome to have this conversation with you. Dan, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks, uh, Juan, Tim. It's uh, fantastic to be on. Awesome. Fantastic so, to have you on. Yeah. So what are, what are we drinking? What are we toasting for then? Well, I'm in the office because I'm the sort of person who worries about hotel Wi-Fi. I'm visiting New York right now, not based here. So I've got espresso right now, and I apologize. It's not really a cocktail unless you put some vodka in it, but uh, that's that. But what I'm toasting is the fact we seem to have had a free and fair election, and that's a, a good thing for this country. Word. That's a great one. How about you, Tim? Um, I am drinking here some Texas-style Bach from Community Beer Company. It's a local beer here. Pretty good. Um, and uh, I'll cheers to free and fair elections as well. Uh, thank you, everyone who voted. Yeah, cheers to the cheers to the elections. And I'm having, I made a cocktail, I'm having a spicy tamarind pineapple paloma. Uh, so it's a, Smirnoff in Mexico has a fantastic infused vodka, which is a t spicy tamarind vodka. Highly recommend. I've only found it in Mexico. Uh, and then there was some pineapple I had in my kitchen. And then I have squirt, which is what you use for palomas. Instead of tequila, use that. But anyways, this is nice and spicy, really refreshing. So cheers to, to fair elections. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So we got our funny question today. So if you were the picture for a word in the dictionary, which word would it be? You know, I hate questions like this. So you really made me sweat on this one, Juan. Um, and I landed on bemused um, because, uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not originally from around here. I moved to the U.S. about 17 years ago, and I'm still, despite having married an American and, and having all these American in-laws, there's still so much about this country that bemuses me. Um, and so there's that level of bemusement. And then I'm a parent to well, one teenager and one 20-year-old, and man, does that bemuse you. Uh, and then, and then, like just working in in data and technology, I feel like, you know, and this is the segue onto what we were talking about. Like, this we 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 know so many of the answers, right? We know how to do this stuff, and it just bemuses me that uh, as an industry and and as practitioners, we're not able to to get this stuff done like we should be able to. So, yeah, I'll take bemused, please, Juan. Wow, that's a big, that's a, that that was a very well thought out uh, answer. Yeah. Knowing that we told you this question like five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> how, about well. you, how about you, Tim? Um, you know what? I'm gonna go with this. Just a funny response on this one, and I'm gonna say uh, I'll be next to the word y'all because I grew up in Texas. I'm sorry, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and so I had my hard consonants, my nasal talk, and a lot of hey guys. And I have successfully learned to say y'all. So if Tim can do it, anybody can do it, y'all. <laughs> oh, um, so if I would do one, this is a, trying to get something very different. Um, I guess you would have a little phrase, salsa dancer, salsa dancing. That would be me because that is a passion that I have that um, I grew up. I grew up in, uh, in Cali, Colombia, which is the salsa capital of the world. And that was something I've done. I continue to do it. So, yeah. What is a picture of salsa dancing? That would be me right there. Salsa dancing. Nice. 
All right. Well, let's kick this off. All right. Honest, no BS. So, Dan, a couple of months ago, you wrote this great blog post called The Greatest Sin of Tabular Data. Right. So, honest, no BS. What is the greatest sin of tabular data? <laughs> well, so, um, yeah, this, this stemmed from some conversations we were having internally and uh, just thinking about, like, why, why does it take us so long to, to get some of our data engineering done? And, and what, what's the challenge there? And as, as we were talking about it internally and I was thinking about it, it, you know, I realized that so much of this is because in, in tabular data or in a data dictionary of a database, um, all we can describe things in is in terms of their primitive types. So whether it's a, a float or an integer or a date. Um, and as humans, we're pretty good at understanding that and interpreting something beyond that. Um, but typically, you know, even if there's a comment in the data dictionary or there's a, a PDF attached to it that describes the scheme or that describes the, the CSV file you're going to get, it's all just human readable and not machine readable. And it just seems bizarre to me that we haven't like solved that problem that we can say in a machine readable way, hey, this is, this is a float, it's a floating point number, but it's also a unit of measurement. It's, it's barrels of oil per day um, or whatever, whatever that type is, right? That, it's like a stronger type that sits above those primitive types. Um, and if we can do that, I, I just, my, my, my Scooby sense is that uh, we can start to then write code that will do some of those simple conversions for us. And that's, to me, seems like a really, really wonderful opportunity to, to, to cut down on that. You know, there's that old joke about 80% uh, of data science is data engineering, right? And it's, it's like all the jokes, it's, it's funny because it's true. And, and we're not going to cut the 80% down to zero with something like this, but maybe we can chip away at it, right? And, and maybe we can make it easier by, by writing meta code that will solve for some of this. So to me, that's the greatest sin. And uh, it was fun. I put it up internally. And as we got talking about it, I'm like, you know, this is a good one to run externally as well. It had some feedback internally. And then uh, I put it on LinkedIn and you, you started to interact with it, Juan. And um, has some good feedback on it. So it's, it, it is a good one. And, and you know, there's, there's stuff out there we can use to solve this. We just don't today. So, so in a nutshell, the greatest sin is that what I, I mean, putting it in my words, right. Is that the data tabular data is just that data first world, which is like, here's a number. And then you can like, you can do, okay, it's a number. It's a positive number, right. It's uh you can do some means or like just basic statistics around that stuff, but you don't know what it actually means right what is right. the what is right. meaning behind it and you probably have to go ask somebody about it and then you go get that and then that meaning gets lost it's it's not in a way that's tangible for computers machines to be able to go interpret that and that's the problem it's like this yeah. is getting lost we're we're seeing now a lot of these conversations around uh like data contracts and it's i mean it, uh, for me it's like we're all going back in circles i mean yes we need call it contracts but this is just constraints this is just oh a well-defined schema knowing not just oh this is a column that has an integer let's get more specific about that so can you let's get let's get more specific give me some good concrete examples of what are the semantics that you're missing inside that tabular data um and what would you be doing with that but yeah right honest, so, no, yes real examples Real examples. So, uh, look, we're the business we're I'm in is all about commodities information and, and commodity pricing, and and the the information we we share with our customers and we use internally often is it's those kind of production data sets. It's this refinery produced this much uh, gasoline this week. Those kind of data sets, right? But when you're you know when you're talking about that. You have to talk about that in a volume of measurement. You have to say, is it billions of barrels? Is it thousands of barrels? Each one of those has a definition. And so the, the simplest thing is to be able to say, this is the, de this is the definition of that type. But once you, once you do that, with the semantic world, as you know, like you can start to hang other things off it, right? So you can start to say, yeah, this is billion barrels of, of oil per, per day. That's how we're measuring it. So we know the number is not going to be like, it's not going to be a negative number now, right? So we can start to describe some of the constraints around it. 
and describe what we expect that number to look like. We can start to describe confidence intervals and describe what the standard deviation might be. And you can just hang all these additional things off. And data quality to that can then become something that's, that's not you inferring it all or trying to describe all of that after the case. It's just a, a fact of saying, this is my type and this is, this is what I'm hanging in there. So to me, it's, you know, you start with those stronger types, those, those machine readable types that give you that. And then in the semantic world, we can link that. We can say, well, look, if it's barrels per day, here's a conversion factor that will give you that liters per second, right? And it's just simple math. And if you've got that, now I can write software that where I find another data set that's in liters per second, it will do that join for me and do that comparison. Like whether that's in a BI tool or whether that's in a um, data engineering pipeline, doesn't matter, right? The point is you've, you've enriched that that column of data with a more sane, uh, productive use of, of what that data is. Yeah, you can make it much more productive if you add that context to it. Right. Um, but, you know, what, what do you say to people who, who think that either this needs to be or can be just like fully automated? Like, oh, I'm just going to profile it or something like that, and, and that'll give me my context. Are they right? Are they wrong? Um, so that's a it's, a it's an interesting one, right? Because you you can do a lot with, with that profiling of data, right? You can do your distributions, you can figure out your standard deviations, your, your mins and your maxes, the cardinality. And there's definitely a fingerprint for a column of data that you get out of that. And I think that probably to me, that I would I would argue or suggest that that's not wasted work by any means. What I would say to that is that's a clue to how you can then give the human like tooling that says, hey, we think this is temperature in, measured in Celsius, right? Because this looks like other times we've seen that. We've trained on the and that we've seen probe data with this profile for yes or no. And you could do, you know, the rank list of we think it's this, 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 this. So to me, yes, uh, you can you can profile all you like. But to me, I don't believe that you could ever just do this all just through data profiling and have a sufficient confidence that you matched everything correctly. To me, the data profiling is, a, is an aid to the end user to make it easier for them to add that labeling. So the, these sophisticated, call it, I mean, I, I'm going to use the word interchangeably of semantics, kind of well-defined schemas, constraints, contracts. For me, I'm just going to use all these words interchangeably for now. Yeah. So who... Who is going to be defining these the, the these these constraints, these contracts, the semantics, right? I mean, how are they being defined, and is it what is a scalable approach to create and manage them? Well, um, so the the commercial the immediate commercial uh, answer to that is where you have companies like ours or any company that has an API, you have an incentive to make it easier for the con consumer of that data to understand and, and, and get you know, faster time to market with the consumption of that data. So you know, I would say if, if there were standards around here that the market was, was pushing for, any data we're sharing with our customers, we'd immediately start to mark this up and put that labeling in there. Because we do it today. We publish Swagger, and it has all this commentary in it that says, here's what our API looks like. But again, what we're and, and from the swagger, yes, you can create bindings, right? So you can simplify some of that. But we're not we're not giving you that extra lift. But if if we could, if there was a way that as an industry we agreed we could do that, we straight away would do that. And then, you know, we internally, it to me it all starts to be, you know, that kind of snowball effect that if you've got two data sets and one's got this and you can see that, hey, to pull this into my Tableau or to my Power BI, it's much quicker because there's, there's you know, intelligence built in my BI tool that it understands how to do this. Then that starts to create an internal demand, right? In the same way that you have internal demand for a data catalog today, to me, this is just, it's a, it's a, a sort of obvious consequence of the easier you make it for, uh, for anyone to consume the data, the more you create that demand for the data to have that markup, if we all agree on how to do it. And that's that's the biggest challenge here, right? 
Mm. Yeah. So we need to agree on how to do it. So that way expectations are clear and the work is clear. But it sounds like you're kind of referring to sort of a feedback loop where um, if it's being consumed, that creates demand, that creates more benefit to, I'm going to call them the data producers to do a better job of enriching and, and documenting their data. And is this sort of a flywheel that you're kind of talking about here? That's that's. Yeah, that, that's kind of my uh, can I achieve this before I retire aspiration, right? So it's, and, and look, we are, you know, my company is in a really nice position on this because we have a little bit of a bully pulpit and we also are in a position where we're selling data and there's clear incentive for us to make it as easy as possible for our customers to consume that data. Um, but I'd say internally within any organization, this is just an extension of that data governance, right? The, it's about making your internal data easier for everyone to consume. Um, we have the data citizens. How is it that we're going to make it easy for them to consume this stuff? So, yeah, there is a flywheel nature to this, no doubt about it, Tim, because we, we see that with every technology, right? And every kind of, like, what's what was the flywheel that drove HTML 30 years ago? It was because there's enough content and it was solving a problem that wasn't really solved before. And, and you just... It, compounds and compounds and compounds, and then all of a sudden, network effects take over. I, I, I love what you just said about the, I mean, this is issue about governance. And, and whenever I hear about governance, I, I'm a big fan. I love Laura Matson's work, her book. I recommend it all the time, Disrupting Data Governance. And the reason why I like it so much is because she has this great table that says how much time, what is, how do you spend the work on governance? And we usually kind of come from the world of it's all about protection, but it's now about being the ambassador data so people can go use it. I mean, that's how you disrupt data governance. And right. this is what you're saying. Like, this is part of that disruption is making sure that the data is not, be, we want the data to be used, but make it even used faster and kind of successfully used. And it's putting that semantics. So putting that effort in the semantics in is is part of that process of of the of the data governance and that uh, offensive, like proactive. Let's go do something with the data. Well, right, and and here's the really cool bit: is if you if you do sort of some version of what I'm thinking about and we're talking about here, it travels with the data. So if I if I create a query that joins two tables that have these semantic tags on, then the, the query result will have those tags as well. Um, because the types don't change unless we do some kind of operand on the column. And then in that case, you would have to revert back to the primitive. So, you know, the views and, and all of those other tools that we have for how we connect and join data, they can all take advantage of this and it can flow through as part of that sort of technical lineage if we can make it machine readable. So let's get, let's get a little bit into the technical side here, because yeah. this is, you said something is like, it, if we agree how to do this. So how, <laughs> how, how should we be doing this? What are the, the, the tools? I mean, we, we, we both, you and me, Dan, and also Tim here about the, the, the technology behind it. For us, it's always the semantic technologies, semantic web technologies, the RDF and OWL, yeah. all this stuff is out there. What are those other tools? Is it that, is it something else? What should the vendors, other database vendors and BI vendors and I mean all types of vendors that are related to data. What is your message to them? Yeah, so so this is this is the bit I love, right? So um, if you go back 50 years, one of the sort of winning things that um, the relational database guys did, IBM and then Oracle, you know, all of that sort of late 70s, early 80s, was they they really codified data dictionary. And if you think about how many times the data dictionary gets called within a database technology, like everything relies on it. Because when you have a data dictionary, what you have is this description of your, your, your tables and your structure in a machine readable manner. So we, we've already we've solved machine readable to some extent already there, right? And you have all of this tooling downstream of that that relies on it, right? Any catalog product will go and read the data dictionary of the database because there's a whole bunch of information in there that you can expose. Uh, any BI tool goes and does the same thing. So that data dictionary is, is this meta layer that, as an industry, we've, we've done a really good job of standardizing on. And, and it's interesting when you think about the big data guys, as that came out with Hadoop and everything like that, they all copied it because it was something we all understood 
And if you if you made that available over an ODBC or a JDBC connection, it would all just work, right? And the tooling on the other end would just work. So this this sort of model of tables and columns and, and relationships between them is something that tons and tons of tooling works so with, just, right? So just to confirm here, it's basically the definition of what a JDBC returns, right? The the information schema, like this is something that's well defined. Every single database yeah. tool engine right, is going to pro it provides this already. Like no, you don't yeah. even think about it, right? This is all right. It's all built in, and that's like one of the greatest gifts we've managed to give ourselves, whether by accident or by design, is things like JDBC and ODBC because they they allowed that indirection layer, but allow that metadata that data definition to, to cross that boundary. And that's incredibly powerful for a whole ecosystem of tooling that we'd be much worse off with if it didn't exist. So my sense of that is give me one more, um, you know, when I define, describe a column, I can, in most of the data dictionaries, there's going to be a type on it and there's going to be a human readable comment. It's give me another field in there, which is a URI. Right. And this is the bridge to that semantic world. And, you know, as Juan, you and I talked about this many times, we, we, we sometimes do ourselves with uh, a disservice with the semantic world, right? Because we immediately jump off into talking about graphs and all of that stuff, right? And it, it, I think people can get lost in that. What I'm saying is take that field, give me an, an ability for that field for me to put the URI of a more complex type in there. And that can be a more complex type that I define and put out there, or it can be one, it can be a schema.org type or any of the other masses of types that already exist out there, right? And the thing, the really cool thing about this is there's already a demonstration of this with CSVW. So you can go to csvw.org and it tells you exactly how to associate those stronger types, those more uh, elevated types to a CSV file. And we're using a, a little lump of JSON to do it. So we've, we've already shown that this can work. But to me, until it's something that's in those data dictionaries, and it's something that can flow through that ODBC connection, that JDBC connection, so that all the tooling can say, oh, if, is that there? I'll take advantage of that. That's where it becomes really powerful. Dan, where does technology play uh, a role in this? Is it, um, is it serving the need and we just need to embrace it more? Is the tech falling short? So I, yeah, well, <laughs> so, so I think my, my hot take on that is going to be that like the, the predominant model that we have today, which is a relational model, tables, relationships, that data dictionary thing we just talked about is it's an industry standard. We all are using it. Um, but that technology, where's the innovation in that? The innovation in that has all been in how we store, how we do query execution, how we do performance. You know, we had the, the whole columnar thing happened. We've got the duck DBs of the world. That's all, that's all great. But where I would argue that side of the technology is letting us down is they're not solving these these questions of interpretation they're not trying to solve that and then you've got a semantic view of the world which is all about solving that but because it it there's a real tendency for that to kind of stare at its own navel quite a lot and and lose you know it's never really become that much of a mainstream product and makes mainstream technology and part of that i suspect is because that there's the semantic world and that relational world or that relational ecosystem, if you want to call it that, haven't really connected and found found the common ground. And and that's what I get so excited about this. And that's why I kind of joke about retiring on this one, because it's like I feel like CSVW and, and what we're talking about here is it's where you those two, you know, Venn diagrams can slightly overlap and we can get some advantage of both. So, so, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm with you on this, Dan. I mean, we, we kind of come back from the same pedigree, you and me, on yeah. this. Um, but then I, I, I'm pausing because as I'm here's the thing, this doesn't seem to be a technical problem. 
I mean, I think the, the solution is there. Now, either people, I ask myself, why aren't kind of the vendors or, or actually the consumers who are now, we're now talking about all this data contracts, right? The semantic layer, DBT is bringing the semantic layer on these things. And you, you go off on LinkedIn and you're hearing everybody data contracts and data quality. So we have these pains. I, 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 there, there's no, there is the incentive. And now everybody's going off and basically reinventing things and doing things again and again. So why, so why is that? I mean, um, yeah. Uh, like, like, why is it we're not using um, uh, Corba? Why is it we're not using uh, Wisdo and Soap? Right. Fair, why, fair why point. Fair point. Using, right. As an industry, we love to solve the same problems over and over again. Um, like, I've never felt, never met a developer who didn't like to solve a meta problem. Right. There's, it's always far, far more fun to to abstract the piece of you know the business problem you've been given and say well i'm going to write something that's a bit cleverer than that and create another layer of abstraction that solves that problem that's a far more intellectually satisfying task uh and i isaac knuth the the quote about you know the um there's no problem in computer science that can't be solved with another layer of abstraction except the problem of too many layers of abstraction right so so i think there's there's part of this which is like people come up with new ways to solve old problems. And sometimes those things move along a little bit, but you know, you look at GraphQL, you look at OData. Well, great. You've built another query language, um, but we already had one of them. Um, so, so I think some of this is just that, that human nature that we have to try and solve our problems and, again. And I think some of this is um, some of this is uh, essentially uh, an idea that it seems maybe too hard or too difficult uh, to actually do that semantic thing because people don't understand it. But I don't know. I, I struggle with this one. I really do, Juan. It's like... Because I play devil's advocate on this. It's like we could say, well, I, we can just implement these types of semantics in some sort of a store procedure or in triggers or in things like that, right? I mean... Yeah, but... I mean, yeah, you can. I mean, but... now you have Python, like people, you can embed the Python inside of Snowflake and stuff like that, right? Maybe isn't that the answer? No, it's Couldn't not. Couldn't that be an answer? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't think it is because I don't think you've made it the same first class citizen that you, you have with, a, a, you know, the data dictionary, right? And that, that's the greatest gift of the relational model is, is that data dictionary stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's you, you can solve, like, you can solve some of this with things like great expectations if you want, but you're not solving it in a way that gives you network effect. I think that's that's probably the kind of key point, right? It's network effect is the, the important point here. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by network effect? Because I see Juan and Dan glowing with that statement, and I want our listeners to understand a little bit more about why you're glowing about that. Yeah, I mean... Um, Network effect is uh, fundamentally why why Twitter is like the number one platform and 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 it maybe won't be later on, right? It's this idea that um, in any kind of competition of ideas or of social networks or of of other ways that we as humans interrelate, there's this this marketplace of them, and as as some start to rise to the top more and more people are talking about them and, and using them, like whether it's a software package or a technology. And if you're using that tool and I'm using that tool, our lives are easier. So then you and I start using it. So it's, it's this, this crazy nonlinear scaling thing that happens and the social network guys all see it. Um, it's and, the and web. Road that way. It's, it's the web, right? It's, the it's, web. Right, it's Tim Berners-Lee network effect was what made HTML and uh, HTTP work, right? Because it was there was stuff before it. There was Gopher and Archie and all yeah. those things that old people like me remember. Um, but they weren't getting that, like they didn't have enough usage. And so they didn't reach that critical mass. Um, but it, you know, and it's, it's we, we've seen this in technology time and time again, Tim, that there are some technologies that achieve that kind of lift off velocity of that that, that network effect um and then there's some that that die off um 
you know, I, I'm old enough to remember SGML, which was what came before XML, and it was cool, um, but you, it was really, really tough to use. XML came along, it was a simpler version of it, and all of a sudden, that was the predominant way of marking up text, and then HTML came along, right? So it's, it's that network effect is that idea that if enough people are using it, everyone uses it, I guess. Yeah, this is interesting. This is an aspect that I think people don't talk about enough or think about enough, and is maybe one of the undervalued aspects of the semantic world, but perhaps why it will succeed so greatly long term is that, like what I wrote down in my notes here is uh, the more you add to it, one plus one is greater than two. Whereas yeah. traditional approaches, one plus one equals two, or more often one plus one is less than two. There's actually debt involved with accumulation. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that, and that debt will drag you down over time if, if you're not careful. Um, I think, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm looking at this as kind of the computer scientist, right? And to me, the reason, the reason I push so hard on this being a data dictionary thing, um, and to me, the reason why that seems so valuable is it's very rare uh, in our domain to find standards that survive decades test of time, right? Like ASCII is one of them. Unicode will be one of them. Right, these some basic standards for how we describe like characters, um, but SQL is one of those. Right, the that that SQL model. How many people have now worked, written SQL interpreters and query optimizers? Right, but they all rely on that same language, and that suggests to me that SQL and the data dictionary model is in, is a really really good abstraction. Like it's an abstraction that's adding a ton of value. Therefore, the, the, the desire to move away from it just isn't there. So I'm just saying, hey, can I just add a little bit onto that that's orthogonal to what you have already, doesn't try to substitute for anything you have already? Because uh, to me, that's then you're riding on the coattails of someone else's network effect, I guess. Yeah, to add to, the net, to this network effect, part of it is that we're a lot of, reinventing the, the the knowledge we don't need to reinvent that knowledge right at some point we want to have that agreement and i think that's the network effect saying hey we're talking about the same thing why keep doing this individually separately let's go combine it i think that's what we see the web has done i mean google search and page rank is that right people start pointing together linking yep. and pointing to things and that's a popular uh that, that's the, the popular kind of interest that people will have and i think uh, the goal here is also to just reduce the amount of, of, of redundancy that happens organically within that network at the end of the day, yeah. it's like, hey, it's great. I don't have to go do that because somebody already did that. Thank you. Or if I need to extend it, I can. then I have to go do only that delta, not do all the other work that people have done. Yeah, well, here's a great sort of pseudo-semantic example, right? How many times do, you, do people just link to Wikipedia when they want to describe a concept, right? Because it's, it's like we all know Wikipedia. It's so big, so it's, it's kind of a de facto. If I want to say what's acid, well, here's the link to Wikipedia. And, and so that link to Wikipedia, and you know where I'm going with this, Juan, it essentially becomes an identifier for that idea, right? Um, and, you know, a great example I've, I've seen used in, in business is GeoNames, wonderful website, because if I say London to you, like your interpretation of London and my interpretation of London, Tim, you've got one in Texas down there, you know, somewhere around you, Right. But to me, my London's different. Whereas if I if we all agree on an identifier for London, then we don't have to go. Oh, wait, Tim was talking about a different London. Yeah, I think this is again goes back to why identifiers are so important. And oh, and, 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 and it goes I mean, the solution seems pretty straightforward is, hey, take that data dictionary we already have add a right. column, which means which the, the, the semantics of that column is. There's more information, more knowledge in that link. Go follow that link and that's it. I'm not saying anything else. And then you follow that link and that link should go present to you some self-describing metadata saying, yeah, machine can, inter can interpret this. And I think that's where we need to go to. It sounds a really simple solution. Is, do you, I mean, is, is, is this your, is this it? Is it, you're calling all the database vendors, all the tools, add another, call me your data dictionary, call it C also. And we, and where, where the type is a URI and, and is that I it? It isn't isn't like aren't, aren't some of the best ideas the ones that are really simple? Um, so 
yeah i mean that's basically it right and i've talked to some of the vendors um like i said before you know one of the benefits of this role is we we, we get to have relationships with some of these guys and i do talk to them and and they're like huh that is an interesting idea and and then of course the second thing they say is you know we'd love it if our customers were, were asking us about this right and it's like well of course right i get it that's how prioritization works and so you know when you and i said or when you reached out to me about talking about this it's like that was one of my goals is like go go tell your vendors that you want this supported and to read bennett's stupid blog about it and and see if there's a there there so yeah i i, I think it can be that simple i think what happens if you do that is it does you know the immediate then question is like yeah but wait what's that link going to go to right and for for again if i think about the, the the model where i'm sharing data with my customers what that will force me to do is to put that documentation out there in a web accessible form machine readable and human readable so that those types are out there and available and so our definition of a barrel is available right and it's out there and we talk about what a barrel is. Um, and, and, you know, the kind of interesting thing about us is as a pricing agency, we have to be public about what our methodology is for pricing anyway. And part of being public about and, and explaining that methodology is, is to say what your conversion factors are. And, and we have that data out there on the S&P Global website right now. Um, but let's put it out there in a way a machine can read it much easier, right? So it would force kind of it forces a hand um, and then you'll see people going, well, I don't want to redefine that type. Is there one I can already use? Oh, yeah, I'll use geo names to describe places. Yeah. Okay. So this is an interesting example of um, tying it to a specific business scenario where you've you've applied this and it's created real value for for you guys at SP Global, but also more for y'all. For y'all. Yeah, for y'all. Yeah, and for y'all, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I got Texas, uh, I got Texas right here on my poster, y'all. Um, so uh, you know, can you talk uh, give some other examples of like m how this creates business value or like how money came out of it, right? Uh, where this this machine readable context was the difference maker. Well, so to be clear, Tim, um, like this is something we want to do and we're figuring out how do we do it if we don't have the vendors like doing it, helping us with it, right? And the answer to that is an ugly answer, right? Because it means you, you build some layer over the top and do I really want to be in that business? But as we've talked about it internally, the value just internally is all about reducing our data scientist time to um to merge data sets and build their models reducing the time that our model modelists and an analysis so the, the folks who are you know figuring out the supply and demand curves for the next five years of diesel refining or whatever it is that you know it sits within our business where where we have these domain experts building these models and trying to you know answer those kind of questions so it, it's about helping them and giving them quicker time to answer and then it's about us having a better set of tools for our data quality. So as we, um, as data is passing through, if it's got these tags on it, there's a, there's a whole set of associated standards, uh, a thing called shackle and stuff like that, where you can then start to uh, put real constraints around your data. And again, you can solve the meta problem of, like, let's just describe this in metadata because the data quality tooling today really primarily rests on that profiling approach that we were talking about at the beginning. And it's great and it's valuable, but it's even better if you actually know the, the type and you know some hard rules on that type, right? This is temperature measured in Celsius and it's never going to be below this minus number. I forget, is it whatever that 273 or whatever it is, right? It can't be like physically cannot be below that number. And so if you see a number below that, it's an immediate data error. It's not just an outlier. Um, so you can, you can go after those quality, data quality things. And then, you know, where we, we, you know, if I don't have a situation where I can share this directly with my customers because there's not a way for them to consume it, I can at least uh, take this data and I can generate a whole bunch of 
docu user facing documentation. In theory, you could generate your swagger from this, all of those kind of things, rather than hand curating that. Because every time you hand curate those, like that's opportunity to fail. And it's opportunity for it to drift from the actual underlying definition, right? And we see that a lot in documentation just by nature. Yeah, I'm, start, I'm starting to see this uh, more with just kind of customers and, and prospects I go talk to is that they want to have automatic generation of IT artifacts saying, because oh, I want to have a swagger file. I want to have a SQL DDL. I want to have the, a Provost scheme or whatever. Like these are things that are being created. They're probably not always being created automatically. If there's some human involvement, then there's it's error prone right there. And by the way, these are just kind of syntaxes, different versions of different ways of representing the same meaning about this in different syntaxes. There, there's we, we just need to make sure that that we're eliminating any type of uh, er errors provided by humans. So I think that's one of the advantages that I'm seeing of having the semantics is that you're automatically generating much more IT artifacts. Another another thing, there's there's two two aspects. One is from the technical side, one from the business side. I think on the technical side, I'm seeing again hearing all these conversations about data contracts and stuff. I think this needs to be really pushed down, ideally, to the moment that the data is being produced. So it's something that the producer, the original producers of the data, are the ones who need to be demanding this too, saying, "Hey, if I'm creating this application, I want to make sure that the application is being kept." correctly and, and what does correct mean that's where the semantics is because right now that is getting lost and then when people are consuming it then they have those issues and then those things are happening somewhere else in the middle of the of, of, of the of the trajectory of where this data ends up so i think th there needs to be more ownership also on the kind of on the very on the technical side of where the data is being produced about this yes, um, yes. but then on the business side i think this is where there's opportunities to be had that I'm not, we're, I'm not there. We're not there yet as an industry because I think there's still this big disconnect from the what the business really thinks about the value of of data. The business provides values of data because yes, we generate insights and all these things, blah 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 blah. But if we get into more of these technical stuff, that the that the tech side is all already so concerned for their technical things, how do we drive that directly to making money and saving money? Right. Uh, so if I have this particular constraint on this column. Of, of this number has to be between this and that. What is that implication if that number is not there for the bottom line, the revenue of the company? And yeah. I'm not saying that there's always going to be one, but I think if this is the opportunity for the tech, the data teams to say, hey, if I start having that business literacy, understanding the context of the business, I can make that argument saying, we need to have well-defined data here because if the numbers ever come out because of human error, or whatever, we're trying to avoid these things, we're going to avoid all these risks. We're going to not leave money on the table and uh, so forth. And I think that's the opportunity uh, that the data teams need to have is to understand more the business and be able to go translate the business value, the making money, uh, be, we need to make more money here. And that's how we're going to go explain this to other people. Yeah. I'll stop ranting. No, no, I, I, you're right. Right. So, and so I, I sort of worked um, hypothetical is inventory levels, right? Um, whether, whether it's warehouse inventory levels or it's uh, uh, your, um, your produced fuel, refined fuel sitting in, um, you know, in, in a port, that inventory level uh, is driving a whole bunch of financial decisions uh, all along that supply chain of whatever that inventory is, right? And do I need to order more? Do I need to order less? And the more accurate and less error you have in that inventory level, especially if you're doing this at scale where there's a lot of sort of just algorithmic decision making based on this, those can be meaningful numbers that come out the end uh, in terms of the consequences if, if that inventory level comes through completely wrong, right? So, you know, and, and we're kind of seeing it a little bit in the chip industry right now, right, where there's a massive glut uh, of certain chips because everyone back in COVID, you couldn't get them. And then like, it turned out everyone was actually hoarding and, and like, this is monetary impact that these things have. Now imagine you get some errors in that data. They gotta be in there. I don't believe all that stuff is hundred percent accurate. So Dan, before we go to our lightning round, Right. For our, for our listeners, for, you know, the data practitioners, the data leaders and the, even the vendors. Right. What should uh, 
what's your advice for them? Like, what, what, what do we do next? What's the action? Um, the, the action is start, uh, if, if you, if you buy into this, if you think that there's might be value here, um, go, you know, especially if you're a big company that has pool with these vendors, um, next time you're meeting with the account manager, throw that blog post at them and say, Hey, uh, this is kind of a cool thing. When are you guys going to do this? And when you're talking to, to us or your information providers say, Hey, when are you guys going to do this? Right? Because ultimately the way these things change is someone sees some dollars like in adding this feature and someone sees some first mover advantage, like, like think about serverless analytics, right? Snowflake came along and like, like really drove that market because there was real dollars to be saved in that. Now everyone's got a serverless answer, right? Because like you're, yeah, keeping the cluster up and running all the time is expensive. Um, this is the same thing, right? Once it gets to a certain critical mass of people saying, you know, this would really help. Can we get this done? Um, someone will see dollar figures and they'll prioritize it. And if it's as simple as I think it is, it's not even a big ask to add it into the data dictionary, right? It really isn't. This is a great takeaway. Uh, you have a very specific uh, action uh, for everybody here. So hopefully this is for all sites, right? For the for the vendors, for the for the buyers, for the consumers, for the producers of data, everything. I think this is a very, very specific takeaway. So let's go to our lightning round, uh, which is presented by data.world, the data catalog for your successful cloud migration. And I'm going to go first. So uh, we talked a lot about the data dictionaries. Um, so is the data dictionary going to go away so to have this new thing or is it just going to be an expansion like the same data dictionary we have today it's not going to change just a little bit slight slight thing or it needs to be revamped no nope, just just ever so slight expansion it already tells you to type uh all i'm asking for is it for me to tell uh for it to tell me the complex type as well if it knows what that is otherwise just tell me the primitive type nice so embracing data dictionary, taking it to the next level. Yeah, exactly. All right, second question. If we truly solve semantics and context around data, can we get to a point you think where things like data integration are automatic because that context is just so pro prolific or is that a pipe dream? Uh, I, I think you can get 80% of the way there. Like I'm a huge believer in the 80-20 rule. Um, and data integration is so freaking hard today, right? And we spend so much time and money on it. That's what I'm trying to solve for here is let's, let's solve the 80% grunt work of that. We solve 80%. We make a lot of people happier. Right. Yeah, we still need the consultants and stuff to go to that 20%, right? Well, absolutely. <laughs> There's a business there. <laughs> you don't take all the business away. All right. So third question. Uh, do all the semantic standards that we need already exist? We just need to embrace them? learn them, popularize them, or is there stuff that's actually not out there yet that we still, still needs to be defined? Uh, interesting, uh, interesting question. I think, I think, yes, all the semantic standards exist for, for the base level of implementation here. I think if, if this actually got traction, you'd probably see kind of son of shackle or, or, or daughter of shackle that was more around the profile of the data and allowing you to describe the profile of the data, which Shackle doesn't, at least it's been a while, but I don't think it really, it's, Shackle's more sort of declarative and deterministic on the way it describes the data right now. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, fourth question, last question. Are you a fan of the buzz around semantic layer? driven especially by DBT and, you know, those folks? Or are you kind of disappointed in it, uh, concerned by it? What's your adjective? Um, it, <laughs> I, that semantics doing a lot of work in, the, in that marketing speak. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of any use of the word semantic that doesn't include machine readability. Because to me, 
the whole like how can we be so far down this this AI uh, road and not have like really addressed that? It blows my mind. So no, it unless we unless we would we mean by that machine readability, not a fan. Hmm. Good, that good, is uh, a very important takeaway right there. Um, I'm marking that as mid 49, something you just said. That's a very, <laughs> that's, a, that's an honest, no bullshit right there. Commentary on what a semantic layer. <laughs> All right. The, I mean, Dan, I told you we can keep talking for this uh, topic, yeah, right? topic for hours and hours, but let's time to go to our takeaways. Tim, take us in with your takeaways. Awesome. Takeaway time. So um, we started off with kind of, you know, What's what's this uh, this blog post you wrote, right? Uh, about you know needing to uh, uh, to really expose the greatest sin of tabular data, um, and you really pointed to the fact that um, you know why does it take so long for us to do our data engineering, and uh, you know it, it kind of all points back to the tabular database being very limited in the context that you can describe. You can describe these primitive types, float, integer, string, um, and then and then you, maybe you're going to create a PDF or something like that, uh, which has documentation or imagery and things like that, but that's human readable, uh, you know, mach not machine readable. And if it, if it is machine readable, it's barely so and, and lacking context, right? Um, and really, uh, it's not just a float, right? It's a unit of measurement. It's uh, barrels of oil per day. And this context it sits above the data, and if we can connect this, um, and if we can write the, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, we'll be able to do things like write the code that actually uh, provides uh, the conversion for us. Um, and it's an opportunity, you said, to cut down on this whole 80% of data science is the, is the plumbing and the janitorial work and things like that. We can really make a huge dent in this. And uh, what are the semantics um, uh, that, that you're missing? Like right now, often the data is being used in like oil and gas. These are like the production data sets. Um, but you have to talk about these things in terms of units of measurement, in terms of the specific definitions. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that we're doing it right now is too simplistic. You, you have to be able to do more and it has to be more um, declarative, right? More binary where like it can never be negative. Uh, you know, here's the confidence interval. Uh, it should always be this type. And, uh, and you talked about um, automation is not some sort of a silver bullet here. Um, it helps. It provides additional context. You can get that fingerprint. It's not wasted work for sure. It's part of the overall equation. Um, but uh, there's more that needs to be done that involves humans. And, and there has to be a, a process where humans are involved. And so we talked a little bit about scale. Well, how do you scale that human involvement? And um, you said that, uh, you know, companies like S&P um, have uh, incentives that really make the data, that, to make the data uh, usable as fast as possible. Um, and those incentives are important. And uh, so if you think about things like Swagger and saying, hey, you know, you got to create Swagger documentation, um, you know, you got to think about similar things in the world of, uh, of semantics and the data dictionary. Really think of semantics as an extension of data governance. Um, and, uh, and then we kind of started to then get into how do you agree on how to do that, right? Uh, back, in the, back in the day, the data dictionary was this concept that kind of came out. Uh, but, um, you know, it wasn't fully executed. Uh, and especially when things like big data came out, um, it also uh, made this a challenge, right? It came with a data dictionary, but it was not something people could use very easily. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just a whole bunch of opportunity here for improvement, and it can be simple, right? And you pointed to a very simple opportunity, which is, what if you just have the ability to have an extra field that points as a reference to something else, right? And then now you have your identifier. Um, all of a sudden the game changes. And so I think that's an interesting opportunity here. And then I'll toss the baton over to you, uh, Juan, to continue. Yeah. So we're talking about how technology may fall short here. I think as a standard, I mean, the world, the, this data world, we have the relational model as a main standard uh, where but innovation in, in the relational database world has been more mainly about storage and compute right vectorization but they are not solving this hard problem of interpretation of semantics right uh, and there seems to be this gap between the semantic world and this relational world i haven't found a common ground you did highlight that csvw take a look csvw.org right csv is a the csv on the web standard that the w3c has and it's a way of showcasing how this overlap is starting how it is overlapping um and then, uh, but as an industry, right, we love to solve the same problems over and over again, right? We did uh, uh, Corbin, I hear Corbin, I, I, I got introduced <laughs> to Corbin like in 2000, 
three, four, I don't know. That was weird. With Zilla White. But creating another layer of abstraction, like that's always a more intellectual challenge. You want to go work on those things. And, and, and I guess that's kind of why we reinvent the wheels a lot. But what we really need is to make semantics first-class citizens. That's the important thing and, and make that part of the data dictionary because, yeah, we can go solve this with any other tech, but we need to make a first class citizens because by doing that, we can have that network effect. And I think that's a very clear a key takeaway here is that we want to be able to have that network effect just like the web has it. And I think Tim brought a very insightful kind of observation here is it's, it's the one plus one is greater than two because traditionally we think about one plus one is two or often one plus one is less than two because we have that debt in there. Um, and we've always thought about the standards, right? Who will stand the test of time, ASCII, Unicode, SQL. So we really need to be able to, to, to build on the shoulders of those giants. And I think that's why tapping into this uh, SQL, extending that a little bit, by right? having that column that says see also and point to that URI is gonna is, is, is a very small lift and, I, and you're already making a first class citizen right there. Um, so seems like a very simple solution. And But how do we get this? Uh, your, call, your call for arms here is, hey, if you buy into this, especially if you're a big company that has a pull with all these vendors, throw your blog post at them, right? Don't forget the blog post is called The Greatest Sin of Tabular Data. You should Google that. Uh, throw that blog post at them and ask them what they're gonna, if they're going to go do with this. And if you work at a company, throw this, uh, it, it, your consumed data from some data company, throw it, at, throw it at them too. And I think at the end of the day, people will start seeing the money and the first mover advantage around that. And, and by having these semantics, it's, I mean, it's about reducing time. It's about reducing risk. We can start automatically generating more of these IT artifacts and then start tying it more to, 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 to direct making money and saving money. Uh, Dan, how did we do? What, uh, what yeah, you nailed it, guys. It's pretty, pretty good coverage. Well, I mean, it, it's all your content here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so let me throw it back to you. Three final questions, Dan. One, what's your advice? Second, who should we invite next? And third, what resources do you follow? Yeah, um, so my advice is when you're doing a podcast, move around more so the occupancy sensor doesn't turn off the light in the office here. Um, <laughs> and, 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 but more importantly, um, you know, I, I, I've been in, in this career for almost 30 years now. And what I've learned is you've got to enjoy what you do uh, and do what you enjoy. Uh, life's too short not to and and i know this this might sound kind of completely hackneyed but man like i just love this stuff and and so it's easy to talk about and it's easy to kind of just geek out on this and keep going after it and and you know it's just fun right and that's that's hopefully that comes across um who should we invite next or you guys should invite next um you know i, I want to recommend my good friend uh, giuseppe saltini he's based in the uk um Juan, I was trying to remember if you've ever met him. I think you might have, um, but he he was like uh, my my one of my big semantic guys at Thomson Reuters, and he's one of those ones. Uh, he's the rare breed who can talk the semantics and talk the business. And uh, there's you know in our semantic community, sometimes we kind of lose the plot a little bit when we talk to the business. So he does that real good. And then the final question you had was, what resources do I follow? Um, I'm pretty boring on this stuff. Um, it's, I was thinking about it when you sent me that question through. It's uh, Daring Fireball. I just love the way John Gruber writes. Um, and and like if you ever want to figure out how Apple thinks, you just read what he, he writes, and it's pretty much there. Um, I'm, I'm a huge, huge uh, um, blockchain skeptic. So I'm loving Web3 is going just great. That blog that turned up... Uh, uh, earlier this year or late last year, um, and of course, like FTX happening today, right? So, so, I it's it's good to be uh, you know get confirmation bias from that blog. Um, Ars Technica is wonderful. Uh, their coverage of so many things is really really good and in depth. And then um, one that uh, if you're in the UK, you probably know, which is good for basic tabloid level IT coverage, is the Register, um, which I I love those guys um, and their their writing is. Just, just the right level of, uh, of humor. This was great content for us to go follow. And thank you so much for that. Uh, and I do encourage everybody, uh, go Google the greatest sin of tabular data, uh, and you will be very happily surprised to see what shows up there. Some SEO going on there. 
<laughs> All right. Well, next week we're going to have uh, Teresa Kushner from NTT Data, and we're going to be talking about uh, are the data teams actually keeping up with the AI teams? Uh, so that's our topic for next week. And with that, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, as always, thanks, Data.World, who lets us uh, keep doing this every single Wednesday at Catalog and Cocktails. Dan, Tim, thank you so much.